o'clock. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Um, let's jump into the webinar for today. So we've got a, um, a nice set of slides here and a guest speaker. Jeff's going to join us and, and share some of his experience in the field with Growins. And the topic for today is early orchard establishment, those first couple of years after we get the orchard in the ground where we're trying to focus on growth and not so much yield to set us up well for um, years to come in our permanent crops. So um, I'm Dr. Danny Klitich. Uh, I'm the coastal agronomist for Redox. I'll be kind of hosting today, I guess. And um, I work a lot on the coast in avocados, lemons, uh, other permanent crops up and down the coast, grapes, things like that. And then I'm also joined today by Nick. And Nick Lucchesi is our Redox agronomist working kind of the the Central Valley of California, um, and he's been with uh, with Redox for almost five years now. And Nick also is a walnut and cherry grower. So I think that's yep. that's the two, right? Okay. And so he's going to share some experiences from his own farm as well as some of his clients, and we'll we'll talk about that. So I wanted to kick off today, um, and, I'll, and I'll introduce Jeff here in a minute when we get to his um, his section. Or Nick will actually introduce Jeff. I wanted to start today with this video to kind of set the set the stage, I guess, for what we're going to talk about. And uh, let's watch this, and then I'll then we'll talk some more about soil cracking. Did a little digging here, and uh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, let me restart that video. It kind of jumped around there, weird. So here we are, two-year-old almond orchard, Independence. Got a grower complaining about soil cracking. Did a little digging here. And uh, yeah, there's a good reason for it. Rutex and RootRx pushing some roots. That'll work. So that that orchard, um, young almond orchard, was really our, our goal is really to build uh, build root scaffolds, right? And I kind of want to want to introduce that concept of our first couple of years we're really trying to we talk a lot about building structure above above ground and making sure we have this strong structure to support future yields and things like that but the same thing is true underground we just don't look down there as often um, and we really want to have that strong root system that is able to pull up nutrition and otherwise for um, for the future so you know we're establishing roots uh, to pull up nutrition, right? That's our, one of our major, our major goals of the root system as well as support the tree and access water, right? And in, in, in uh, years when we have low water allocations and things like that, a strong root system is going to pay dividends in keeping our crop healthy. So um, agenda for today, a uh, little introduction to who is Redox and then uh, Jeff, Jeff Severson, sorry for the mistype there, um, is going to, from Mid Valley Ag, uh, he's there, one of their tech agronomists, is going to talk about orchard establishment um, research. And then I'll give, I'll give some background agronomy on principles of early establishment. And then Nick will finish this out with field results and an FAQ discussion. Um, and we hope some of our participants will send in some questions throughout to help uh, push that conversation along. Uh, some housekeeping to get started. Uh, if you have a question, please submit it through the chat function on, the, on your app or on your desktop there. There's also a raise hand option. You can use that as well if you'd like to get our attention. Uh, if you are here for CCA hours, uh, we will send out the uh, sign-up sheet and a follow-up email probably tomorrow, as well as the recording to this um, in that email. So uh, with that, uh, the purpose of Redox, we really exist to create passion, excitement, growing plants. And I hope that we bring some of that to this, uh, this discussion today and hope help to give you some ideas on how to drive that that passion and um, and also drive those yields into the future the really based on three key uh three core values here at redox passionately authentic creatively driven and scientifically knowledgeable to put it simply redox is a bionutrient company that focuses on sustainable plant nutrition and um, I think there's a lot of fun technologies in the nutrient world and more and more every day. So I hope to bring some of those to you and kind of talk about how they might fit into your growing program. Uh, Nick, would you like to introduce Jeff for his section? Yeah, so going off uh, <clears throat> what Danny said, um, uh, Jeff works for Mid Valley Ad Tech, Tech Services. Uh, he's done a lot of research and almost all crops, but specializes in almonds and uh, walnuts. 
and um, he's going to share with us some of their trials and studies that they have had uh, throughout the last couple of years. So Jeff, you got anything to add? Go ahead and take it away. All right, let me just switch my screen here. Is it coming up? Yep. Okay, uh, first off, thank you, Nick and Redox for giving me this opportunity to, to present today. Um, my name is Jeff Sears and I work for Mid Valley Ag Services and our agronomic services department. Um, we offer our sales staff PCA support, as well as we uh, do some internal and uh, third party contract trial work. Um, there are five team members um, that are employed by Mid Valley in our, in our department. And we also um, act, have access to three other private consultants um, to help us with uh, some of our uh, problems in the field. So um, anyway, with that, let's go ahead and start. Today, I'm gonna to talk about uh, foliar and soil fertilizer considerations and new uh, slash developing orchards um, and focus on two uh, trials that we've kind of conducted over multiple years um, for both soil and um, for foliar. And so the topics, you know, soil fertility and problematic soils, this is something that comes up a lot, I think, in when discussing new plantings or developing young trees and then foliar uh, nutrition applications for developing orchards. Um, so let's talk about the soil problems first. You know, some of the problems we see with new plantings um, when discussing soil problems are, you know, one of those being non-fumigation. Um, whether that be a, a personal choice on the grower's part due to um, budgetary constraints or it's a regulatory issue, it just seems like there's more non-fumigation going on um, than in the recent past. Uh, soil nutrient level deficiencies, I mean, that's always been around. Um, we even see that obviously in mature uh, bearing orchards. Um, fast plant back or quick plant back, I think there's been a shift to um, orchards going in, going in um, and, and also orchards following orchards and having that period between a, a taking out of a mature orchard and putting in the new orchard, that period between the two, that fallow period or that period where you rotate into a different crop um, has diminished significantly um, in, since the recent past. So that kind of goes into the next point there, crop non-rotation. I guess you could call it monoculture, but in my mind, even prunus following prunus, you know, for example, peaches going into almonds, you can still run into some issues there. And that's, you know, not technically a monoculture, but it's definitely not rotating, um, you know, for, for in terms of species. And then challenging inherent soil characteristics, you know, soil texture, uh, water infiltration, CEC, organic matter, pH, all of those kind of things. So these are just some of the problems that we see, um, you know, year to year with, with questions regarding new plantings. So let's talk about a little trial that we did in almonds. Um, and I'm only gonna talk mainly about almonds today, but I think for the most part, for any of these points and any of these topics, you can definitely apply it to any perennial orchard system, um, new developing perennial orchard system. So the first trial it was in series from 2018 to 2020. And uh, some of the information on this site, you know, it's a new almond planting, independence variety, um, very popular variety of almond. Um, if you're unfamiliar with, with California almonds, it's, it's the self-fertile, uh, quote unquote, self-fertile variety um, on a Nemegard rootstock, which is a classical peach rootstock. Um, uh, there was an area of non-fumigation, and, and this is probably the most important aspect of this site is there was a house that um, fell within the buffer zone of the orchard fumigation. So they, um, and, you know, consequently could not fumigate a portion, a corner of this orchard. And so that was our focus was, you know, given these other two parameters, you know, low CEC, low organic matter, very sandy soil. Um, as we'll see later, there were a lot of nematodes. And how do we overcome that non-fumigation? And then the last point here, it's, it's a fertigation block. So it's double line drip. The, even the grower um, <clears throat> does most of his fertilizer applications through the drip. 
Um, and so that was our uh, intent was to go on top of his drip lines and inject our materials, our trial. Um, and so let's talk about that. First, first, let's talk about the problems specifically at this site. Um, soil deficiencies, there were a few, uh, nothing crazy, but micronutrients were definitely deficient. We'll see that in a slide here coming up. Um, it was a fast plant back. I believe it was less than 12 months when the old new orchard was uh, taken out to when the new orchard was put in. It is almonds, following almonds. Um, and it, like I said, non-fumigation. There were some pretty high nematode counts you can see in that box um, on the bottom there, ring nematode at 239. Um, this extraction method was per 500 cc's. And I think the UC recommended threshold uh, high threshold for ring nematode is 100 per 1,000 cc's of soil. So we're definitely, you know, four times the recommended amount of ring nematode here. Um, and then, you know, at, at, on the far right columns there of that box, you have the beneficial and um, uh, microbe count, and you want to be around 100 and we're at 55. And the management index is a 0.2 and you want to shoot for 0.1. So basically this this, this report is saying that nematodes are a problem and that you should do something about them. And, and the grower did, they did fumigate, but because of that regulatory uh, buffer zone um, for safety, they couldn't do that portion. And so that led to uh, what we think is poor root health, poor root development and decreased rhizobiome activity or decreased biological activity in the rhizosphere or in the root zone. And then to, you know, um, symptomatically to our naked eye, that's what we see is low tree vigor and low tree growth. And that's what led the grower to come to uh, his sales, his PCA and say, what can we do about this? Here's a, a table real quick, just to set the groundwork again. Um, here's the uh, soil nutrient levels for this site. And we can see um, the, the take home here is there's not much difference between the two, but you can, you can see that we have some deficiencies in some of the major nutrients, phosphorus, potassium, uh, but we also have a lot of micronutrients that are deficient. And um, we'll talk about micronutrients a little later in these slides. But I wanna go back and say like, there's not much difference here in this table, but when you look at the orchard, you can see um, as you go down the row, all of a sudden the trees like to the tree look better. They have more growth, more vigor. So this portion right here with the stunted growth, this is where they didn't fumigate. And as soon as you get to where they, they turn that fumigator back on, you can just see the, the difference in the orchard and difference in the vigor and difference in the growth. So our so the trial, the, we, we already went through the background. Now we're just trying to think of how can we correct the problem? So we were thinking, you know, this is a very exploratory trial. If we're gonna spend money on fumigation, which give or take could be around 12 to 1800 bucks an acre, you know, can we use that money that we're gonna spend on that fumigation and maybe even save a little bit and, and divert it to a more robust um, fertility program, biostimulant root development program. Um, and so that was what we were trying to do. We were just trying to find, you know, a, a proof of concept and just explore the avenues of which we could do that. But our three major objectives that I think we tried to, to shoot for in this trial was, you know, number one, supply tree demand of the deficient nutrients that we already have in the soil and supply the tree demand with nutrients that um, are beneficial for, you know, root growth, root development, which is number, you know, basically the, the second objective was promote root growth and root development. And then the third being enhance root zone biological activity or increase the biology um, in the rhizosphere. Ultimately though, you know, we were, these objectives are trying to answer the question of, can we grow the trees out of non-fumigation situations? So the first objective with deficient nutrients, we, we focus mainly on secondary and micronutrients um, and not just nitrogen, potassium and, and, and phosphorus. And I think that was key um, just to, to provide a more balanced nutritional program for these trees to have the, the nutrients available to them, you know, for, for basically all facets of growth and vigor and whether it be root or shoot. Um, and then we also focused on highly plant available formulations of those nutrients. Um, and that, that coincides with kind of the spoon feeding um, 
you know, uh, moderate rates uh, of fertilizer, but more frequent applications. Um, and then with a focus on root development. So we, we definitely util utilized the soluble protected calcium in this trial. We also used a protected phosphorus in this trial. Um, and, and then again, like I said, we, we went monthly applications. So we fertigated every month. There were six or seven applications per year. So we were definitely spoon feeding these trees. So for root growth and development, you know, we emphasized it's not just a nutrient deal because we do have a lot of biotic stress going on in these in this root zone. We have a lot of nematodes. And you know, given the soil characteristics, there's probably some abiotic stress, water stress um, the going on, even though I, I do want to point out that this orchard in our minds was very thoroughly irrigated. We didn't think we had a, any underwatering or overwatering overwatering issues, which that might contribute a lot to the success. Um, you know, because irrigation is, is very crucial to anything that we do fertility-wise. Um, and we wanted to stimulate root growth. And maybe that means we don't necessarily focus just on nutrients, but we have some products in there that help with root stress um, or, or solely used for root stress. One of those being root RX. Um, we use root RX at two quarts per acre per month. Um, and what we found is it's a very quick response after application. You know, we'd go back at that orchard and try to evaluate three, four weeks later, and we feel like, man, nothing's happening. Well, it ended up being that we were just way too late. You know, that root RX, the effects of that application were very quick. Um, that also translated to that the effects didn't last as long as we thought they would. But I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing. I think, you know, for, for this trial, it definitely enhanced the uptake, and we'll see some pictures in response of the other fertilizers. But since we were going monthly, I don't think having a longer um, activity or response is necessarily needed in this case. Um, so here's a picture showing, you know, root RX alone. And it's actually the, the picture that I previously showed just to highlight the difference in tree vigor. But it was actually a post-planting picture, a uh, post-treatment picture um, that we took. So as you can see, kind of root RX only, the canopy looks fresher, but we're just, you know, when we combined it with other fertilizers, we obviously got a better uh, response. And here's another picture showing um, just some of the growth with root RX alone. We can see, you can see we started to grow, which these trees were just stunted. They weren't, they weren't trying to grow. We did actually, you know, get them to pop a little bit with root RX by itself, but then when we combined it with other, with an organic nitrogen source in this case, you can really see the inner node spacing increase. You can see a lot of lot more lateral breaks. Um, so we were really happy and really pleased with what we saw with uh, these applications. And then enhanced root zone biological activity. Um, you know, or in other words, how do we stimulate the biology in the root zone? And our focus was mainly on organic materials, carbon-based materials. And when I, when I say organic, I don't mean USDA organic, you know, organic fertilizer like that, I mean just carbon-based, amino acid-based, something like that, um, that can provide some nutrient for the tree, but also, you know, maybe some of those, those carbon molecules uh, end up being nutrients for microbes or food source for microbiology. And then we also used a humic acid in all of these treatments to help with CEC, to help give the biology a little home in the soil, and to help with water holding, especially in these sandy soils. Um, it, it's pretty crucial that we can get just a little more water holding, less water stress, let root, less root zone stress. And so another product we looked at was Redox's Dermaplex and one and a half gallons, I know that's a lot, but that's one and a half gallons per acre per application. So we were going six to seven applications a year. So, I mean, you can do the math, that's a lot of Dermaplex. And I think that's a little unrealistic. There was a little communication error between us and and uh, redox at that time. And, but I'm, I'm actually glad we did it because it did prove to us that Dermaplex can really um, make a difference. You know, even if we're at a, one and a half gallons, you know, maybe that's unrealistic, but given the budget, because we're trying to replace a fumigation, you know, application, is it unrealistic? I don't know. Um, but it did show us because we, we applied that in year two, year one, uh, if we go back to this picture, this is basically year one. And I think year two, after we applied the Dermaplex, 
you couldn't tell row one from row two, three, or four. Um, row one caught up uh, right with the other rows. Um, so I do think there's some great soil activity response when using Dermaplex. Um, so in summary, what seemed to help? You know, frequent applications of highly available protected nutrients um, seem to work. Um, I know that, you know, like I said, this is a very exploratory trial. We didn't have a lot of data points, um, but we did see uh, increases in inner node spacing. Um, we did see an increase in laterals, uh, and we did see a decrease actually in number of nodes per inch, which is suggesting that we're getting more growth. We're elongating those shoots, um, which is what we wanted to see. Um, we did, you know, improve root development and increase biological activity. That's easier said than done. I understand that, but um, you know, I think those two things are very key to getting success out of something like this, where it's a fertigation, spoon feeding kind of monthly uh, program. We were happy with Dermaplex and Root RX. You know, we did see a response from both of those. And um, we're, we're gonna continue to work with these, with, with these products, try to get to understand them even more. Um, not that we don't understand them now, but it's just, we think that they're, they're too good of materials to, to pass up and just um, lay by the wayside because there really is, I think, uh, a fit in some of these orchard systems where we have all these stress factors to where these will really make a difference. Um, but overall, no matter what product you use, whether it's, you know, Redox or some other competitor, you, to me and to us, we want to take a balanced and a focused approach. You want to balance the nutrients, micronutrients or, you know, macro, um, and then take a focused approach. I mean, it takes a lot of um, monitoring, it takes a lot of, you know, going out, looking at the trees, uh, making sure you're seeing the results you're wanting to see. Um, it's not a program to where you're just going to apply once or twice or, or maybe even three times a season and just hope that you're getting this, the, the response that you need. Um, so I think if you can do these things, I think it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's not perfect, but you can get pretty close to, to mitigating the stress factors of non-fumigation. So I know I'm probably taking most of my time up now. That went probably longer than I expected, but Let's just jump real quickly to foliar fertilizers. Um, this is another three-year trial in Livingston that we did in almonds. And this isn't a new planting by any means. Um, this is a fourth to six leaf orchard. It's a developing orchard coming into bearing um, or, or into serious bearing years. So this was a cool site because they didn't really run a lot of foliar nutrients. And so we've always wondered, you know, how important are foliar fertilizers in a young orchard? Um, you know, we're not obviously um, trying to replace the soil fertility program at all. Uh, but this was a cool site because we never, we, we don't come across a lot of blocks that don't do any, any foliar fertilizers. Um, this was a sandy loam soil, pretty decent soil fertility and also very good irrigation here as well, which I think helped to have more measurable success for this trial. Um, we, there was low stress in my mind here at this trial. Uh, we'll see in 2019, uh, they did get some pretty severe bacterial blast, but we'll see that in the graphs coming up. Um, our timings for this foliar application uh, fo fertilizer trial, uh, we did five applications, uh, one at pink bud, one at petal fall, one at post petal fall, um, one mid to late May, and then one at post harvest. And these were multiple treatments, um, but our emphasis was on on nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, and, and micronutrients. And this was a program approach. So we had redox, we had other competitors, um, and we, we really didn't mix and match the products. We just stuck to the manufacturers for each one, kind of like a program, a program approach. Um, but also, you know, keeping the same uh, type of mentality, not deviating too far from our emphasis on nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, and a good blend of micronutrients. Um, and the treatments pretty much stayed the same all three years, which is something unique as well. We don't usually typically do that. We, well, we try to, but sometimes you, you know, you have to deviate along the way, but, um, for redoxes and specifically there weren't any, any treatments, uh, the treatment did not change over those three years. So here's just the program for the redox trial, uh, the redox program for this trial. Um, we started off with B55 at pink bud and we went to Supreme at late bloom and petal fall or late bloom slash petal fall. And then post petal fall on, uh, we, we switched to banks. 
And I know that's probably more banks than we typically see in the field. Um, you know, but it's, it's really nice when you see three or four products per tank. You know, when you get into these foliar fertilizer programs, sometimes you get six or seven jugs you got to mix in the tank. And that becomes kind of a headache for the grower, headache for the mixer, loader. So, you know, it was really nice to have, you know, three or four products, you know, and, and not have to worry about adding a bunch of jugs. So, um, so let's just go straight into the results. Uh, 2018, it, it was a, you know, good response, you know, it, no matter if you're redox or whatever other competitor there is there you know they all did pretty well um but when we go to 2019 it almost looks like i forgot to put a one in the graphs but we this orchard got such severe bacterial blast that um you know the 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 yields just plummeted um but i i don't know if you know this was only one year uh, it was replicated so I don't know the, if the 470 uh, means anything, but you know, Redox was the only program that exceeded the the UTC in this in this case. Now I don't know if that's because of the the uh, biotic or abiotic stress mitigation that they have in their products or not versus the other competitors. Um, I don't know, but um, it's just something to think about. And then this year, you know, our yields did look pretty good across the board again. Um, so the blast really kind of hindered us that one year in 2019, um, but I still think we got some pretty good results. And here's the combined yield data uh, over those three years. And as you can see, it's, you know, Redox looks good, but, but also all the competitors look good. So I think the overarching, um, you know, goal here or, or result is that foliar fertilizers for developing orchards coming into, into their high bearing years is, is very beneficial over not not doing any foliar fertilizers at all. And so, you know, to summarize, you know, foliar nutrients at key timings, you know, you say, oh yeah, foliar nutrients applied to key timings is good. Well, the, the tractor's usually probably going in there at key timings anyway for the fungicide sprays. So for us, it's more, you know, can we put stuff in there to help, um, you know, and not have to say, oh, it's gonna be an extra tractor ride or something like that. So if the sprayer's already going through, um, you know, why not put the foliar fertilizers in at that point, um, especially in developing orchards and especially where, you know, you got moderate fertility and moderate stress. It's, you know, it's not a fire. You're not putting out fires. You're just trying to make uh, a good orchard great. Um, and again, we're not trying to replace soil fertility. You know, you got to have, this is a, an add-on addition to soil fertility. Um, we're not trying to replace or, or decrease any of our soil fertility program at all. Um, like the previous trial, you know, we're using highly high quality protected materials, carbon based complexing agents that enhance uptake. And um, I, I think Redox does a great job with that, but I also think all the competitors, you know, there's a lot of companies that can do that. Um, some better than others, no doubt, but um, we should try to stick with those types of materials for this trial. So that's all I got. Um, I know there might be some questions. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions now. I probably took way longer than I was supposed to. Um, but thank you very much for your time and thank you to Redox for letting me present. Jeff, yeah, thank you uh, for your time and your presentation. I really appreciate that. And thank you to the Mid Valley Tech team for all the, all the hard work that you guys do. We, we greatly appreciate it. So thanks for uh, sharing all that information. <clears throat> no problem. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions they wanted to send in? I haven't seen anything pop up yet on my uh, on my chat that we could. If you do have questions, you can go to the uh, question section down at the bottom, or you can just go into the chat box and send them in that way, or we could just wait to the end either way. I'm really appreciative that the Mid Valley guys didn't just rip you apart. Flood, flood the <laughs> chat box for me. So thank you guys. <laughs> Save it for the end. Jeff, you're going to yeah. be able to stick around. We're going to do a little Q&A at the end, I guess. Um, if yeah, no right. problem. Okay, great. You might have spoke too soon, Jeff. Maybe yeah, no, they're, right. actually... <laughs> yeah. they're brainstorming right yeah. now. That's what they're doing. It's it's on now. Yeah. Uh, you need some, need some good some good stumpers for Jeff. Um, yeah, so um, let's, uh, let's go in here. Let's do some agronomy on uh, some more agronomy, some basics on orchard establishment and kind of root development. Uh, so there are, 
here we go. Sorry, my clicker wasn't working. Uh, wanted to briefly go over you know, these four different concepts uh, that are important facets of early crop development. Uh, phosphorus nutrition, calcium nutrition, soluble carbon, and then abiotic stress defense. We have standalone webinars on all four of these topics that we've done over the past several months. Um, so I'm going to go over pretty, uh, uh, pretty briefly each one of these topics. If one of these really resonates with you and you'd like more information on it, we can go over it later here in the, in, during the question and answer section um, to some extent, but we'll also have, you can go check out our YouTube channel and um, there's 45 minute to an hour presentations on each one of these topics um, that I, that uh, I encourage you to go check out because um, it really, especially, yeah, especially the soluble carbon one um, and soil biology and things like that really go, really go in depth in some of these topics. So let's jump into that. Uh, we'll start off with phosphorus nutrition. Now, this is something that is uh, incredibly important in, in young, young developing orchards to have, a, to have phosphorus nutrition. Um, it's really been the focus of a lot of establishment programs in the past is just pound in the phosphorus um, so that we can get in our early crop development and our roots. Um, a lot of that reasoning has come from root development is really phosphorus limited and also phosphorus driven in many cases. So, um, so that, that is, uh, is, is properly guided, but in some ways when we go to, we try to um, feed the crop, we end up actually causing some issues. So phosphorus nutrition, the biggest, the biggest challenge is tie up. So when we apply phosphorus into soil, it readily ties up with, um, with cations in soil, such as calcium, iron, zinc, so on and so forth, and becomes unavailable. So this is a big challenge where we put out a lot of phosphorus and then it ties up other nutrition that those roots need. So it can be one step forward and two steps back in some situations. So the, the solution here is applying a phosphorus product that, is, that remains available and doesn't tie up our key nutritional uh, other nutrients in the soil. So what that looks like in a graphic here um, on the left-hand side, you can see that as phosphorus goes through the soil in solution, it's going to bind up with calcium and other, other cations, forming fairly insoluble compounds like calcium phosphate and things like that, as opposed to if we have a complex um, phosphorus where we have that charge satisfied with, say, fulvic or humic acid or something like that, we'll have a, a more stable compound that the plant is able to use and recognize um, and will not tie up our nutrition. Um, we see really, uh, we see this a lot in, um, in strawberry production where phosphorus is very important to maintain crop vigor, but we also want a lot of calcium to main, maintain fruit quality and we have high applications of phosphorus inputs, we'll see an immediate decrease in fruit quality. So it's just a nice example of kind of um, uh, cause and effect very quickly within the crop. And the same thing is happening. That root tip needs a lot of calcium as it's developing in the soil. And if we don't have enough calcium nutrition, those roots just won't grow. Um, and so we can end up not, uh, not producing a strong root system. Uh, the other thing that's very important for phosphorus availability in the soil is soil biology. We need to push our soil biology. Um, and as that, as that biology uh, uh, res respires and produces compounds, it will loosen up phosphorus and increase its availability within the soil. So, so that is key. Um, calcium, as stated, is incredibly important for that root tip growth and just overall structural stability of cell walls and, 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 and plant tissue, crop tissue. Uh, it has the maybe the paired problem uh, to the phosphorus in that if you apply calcium unprotected to the soil, it will tie up immediately with cations or it can tie up with cations in the soil, such as phosphorus. We have a lot of high phosphate soils already in the, on the California coast and other regions where we grow orchard, orchard crops and those high phosphate soils will tie up calcium very quickly um, and can be a challenge. So similarly, um, applying a, a calcium that is complexed in some way to allow for it to have limited tie up can really be beneficial for pushing root growth. Um, and yeah, so applying plant available calcium is important. Um, and then lastly, or not lastly, sorry, second to last, I guess, soluble carbon is also important. Um, organic matter is very important in nutrient availability and nutrient cycling within, within the soil. So um, pushing along soil organic matter can really help to build a stronger root zone and increase nutrient availability. Same thing with the calcium and the phosphorus is kind of why I'm stumbling here on this is I pretty much already stated a lot of this is that we wanna have 
um, additional soluble carbon in the soil, which allows for a healthier microbial um, microbiology in the soil and better microbial diversity. Uh, microbial diversity is important because if we have uh, low diversity in the soil, we won't have as, um, as diverse a, uh, uh, a menu, if, you'll, if you will, of nutrients available to that plant because microbes are pretty specific on what they do and don't uh, loosen up within the soil and decompose. So uh, the key here is to provide a, a, a complex uh, array of food to them or multiple soluble carbon compounds. So what that looks like, if we have low organic matter available in the soil, we're just not going to have that, that healthy root bio, soil biology, which will not release nu nutrition to the plant. So I already put that slide in, sorry. And then, but as we, uh, as we increase soil, my, soil or soluble carbon, we're going to feed that microbial community well, and that will in turn release more nutrition to the soil and have better root growth. So uh, it's kind of, it's one of those things where we apply soluble carbon to the soil, but we actually get better phosphorus and calcium nutrition, which is, uh, which is, is not something we always think about when we're reading the label on the bag. Um, that's really what we're applying our soluble carbon for, but that's really, that's really what it is, is we feed, we feed the soil microbes, we get better soil tilth, less compaction, better nutrient availability, better nutrient uptake, overall better growth. Um, and then lastly, abiotic stress defense is, is key. So we need to make sure that we, we keep that tree able to deal with stress as well as we can, especially in the Central Valley where we have extreme, extreme summer heat can be very stressful on young trees. In many cases, we have water deficit um, that can be very stressful on root systems and, and, um, and underground, uh, underground biology. And, and there's, of course, you know, cold in the winter and, so, and a bunch of other stressors that we worry about with young trees. So abiotic stress defense, um, I'm going to just define kind of what that looks like here. And so abiotic stress is the negative impact of non-living factors on plant growth, yield, and quality. Abiotic stress will reduce photosynthetic activity, plant respiration, cell wall strength, and root growth and metabolism. Abiotic stress will lead to reduced antioxidant production within the plant. The reduction in antioxidant production can lead to increased susceptibility to bacterial, fungal, insect, soil pathogen, and nematode damage. So graphically, I like to think of it this way. So here's our, here's our standard kind of uh, high school biology, how plants work. We have sunlight and water and carbon dioxide. You combine those together with photosynthesis, you make carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, we combine those with some nitrogen. We make amino acids. Amino acids make proteins. Proteins make plants. Okay, there's, you know, there's several other parts of this um, that we don't talk about a lot where we can also make lipids and other, and other things. Um, but a really important way that plants deal with stress is the production of these secondary metabolic pathways. These, these phytochemicals, the antioxidants, the terpenes, the phenolics, things like that um, are gonna help that plant deal with stress better. And that's really what we're talking about here is, is making sure that that plant has the the components as well as the information to produce those compounds that help it deal with stress better and more and be more reactive to stress events so that they can continue to grow and thrive even under extreme heat or water stress or something else. So, um, so that's our four kind of overarching topics. We want to make sure we hit a good, a good phosphorus nutrition, good calcium nutrition, have soluble carbon in the program and make sure we're dealing with stress. So those are our four, our four topics. And I want to submit to you kind of these four products that we think are very, very relevant in and very relevant in grow in programs. Um, there's obviously more. We talked a little bit about, Jeff talked a little bit about Dermaplex. Uh, micronutrients have come up several times, is very important as well. If you're deficient in something, you need to make sure you solve that deficiency. Um, so things like that. But I wanted to concentrate here on Rutex, H85, Mainstay Calcium, and RootRx. So H85 is, uh, increases microbial diversity. It's a humic, fulvic, and long chain carbon product. It's 15% potassium and 42% humic, plus a good slug of fulvic and long chain carbon in there as well, about, about another 40 so percent. Um, coming out to a very nice total there. It improves soil microbial diversity and soil health, really improves synthetic nitrogen efficiency, as well as soluble across a broad range of pHs. So we also have this product available in an organic formulation. The analysis is slightly different, but similar technology. 
um, just some different uh, organic things going on there. So um, in the manufacturing. So this product really what we were talking about earlier of feeding the soil biology and making sure that we can have good soil, uh, soil nutrition. Uh, and nutrient availability is, is really the cornerstone of that, of that concept here is H85. Mainstay calcium, it helps to build soil structure as well as provide nutritional calcium to the plant. It's 20% calcium, it's microencapsulated calcium. So the calcium is, uh, is highly available and doesn't tie up immediately when it goes in the soil. So it increases soil flocculation, increases water movement, improves root growth, all the things that we look for calcium to do but also it's also gonna help with our water movement and things like that. This as well is available in an organic formulation um, if you are interested. As an organic tool, this product is phenomenal, um, especially over a product such as gypsum or some other calcium products where this can be water run consistently throughout the season through your drip hose and, um, and will we'll, we'll help with water movement in the ground as well as root development. So really a, a really nice uh, organic product. Uh, Calcium is really important in, in, in soil structure. So I want to make sure to highlight that here that really when we're planting, when we've planted new trees, we're really looking to kind of build that soil structure around that root zone and help to kind of establish that saturation zone under our, under our irrigation system and make sure that we have good water movement and things like that throughout our soil. And calcium is a very important part to make sure that it keeps that micropore space open. <clears throat> Excuse me. The, uh, the flip side of that is obviously we don't want to tie up a bunch of phosphorus because phosphorus is also very important for our root development and mainstay calcium due to its complexing technology in microencapsulation of that calcium uh, will not tie up excessive phosphorus in the soil and will allow for that native phosphorus to be available. Um, on that note, applying phosphorus is also obviously a good fertility practice to help push root growth. Uh, Rutex stimulates lateral root branching. It's a 646.5 as a dry. It also has a little bit of humic acid and a nice punch of L amino acids in there as well that are specifically um, designed to help uh, push lateral root branching and root development. It improves phosphorus efficiency and reduces soil phosphorus tie up with calcium. Uh, you can actually mix this product with mainstay calcium under agitation during injection and you won't have immediate tie up if you Try that with a lot of other phosphorus and calcium products on the market. It gets, uh, you go find your shovel pretty fast or a big bottle of acid. So um, that's, uh, that's uh, something that's kind of nice about these two products. You can stick mainstay calcium and Rutex together. We also have Rutex, um, fairly new to our catalog, is now available as a flowable. It's a 215.2. So if you're looking for something um, that's a little easier for handling and measuring or, or what have you, um, you also uh, have this available to you as a uh, some same technology, just a different formulation. So um, for Rutex. And once again, the whole goal here is to make sure we get that phosphorus, uh, not just tied up in the soil, but down to the root system and into the tree to help build stronger roots and crop vigor. So, and then lastly, the fourth, the fourth cornerstone, I guess, here of our establishment programs is RootRx. As Jeff mentioned, it stimulates root growth and metabolism. It's very fast acting, increases antioxidant production, optimizes root growth and quality increases relative strength and viability of those root systems, and overall just pushes crop vigor. Uh, it also helps the plants deal with stress a lot better, and all of that is coming from that, uh, that increase in secondary metabolic pathways and allowing that plant to deal with stress uh, to the full extent it can. So um, that's what I have for the background agronomy here. I wanna hand it off now to Nick, and he's gonna jump into some redox results and field examples. Yep. Okay, so before I get started, I saw that Sam posted something in the chat. Um, and basically, that's just a link to our YouTube channel. So if you do want to go over some of the past webinars uh, that Danny had mentioned, feel free to do that. You can click that link and it should take you right to them. So I'll get started here. Okay, so I'm just gonna go over some of our in-field uh, success stories. Some of them are some that I have done personally, and then there's a couple that are trials. Um, let's see, let's move forward here. Okay, so this is a personal block of mine. This was a new planning uh, in 2018. So this is a couple years old. And what I wanted to do is I did a dollar for dollar program. 
Um, and then I reduced the nitrogen on the redox sides that I did. Um, I had to cut the budget somewhere, so I decided to do that. Less nitrogen, more uptake. Um, so the first one all the way to the left would be a Rutex H85 uh, and then a 28002 program. Uh, as you can see, there's really good growth on those. Uh, this, is a, this is a sandy soil here, so it's a little bit difficult to grow walnuts in especially. Um, but if you kind of look at the stake as a measurement, you could tell that it was a you know, significant foot, two feet over the, uh, over the stake. <clears throat> the middle one is a CAN 17 28002 program. There's more shots uh, of nitrogen, more applications on this program um, to fit the budget, the dollar for dollar budget. Um, I think with these sandy soils, you need something there to kind of hold the nitrogen from leaching. You can kind of look down that row and see that it's pretty consistent down the row of, of uh, lack of growth. So not very good uptake. And then I wanted to experiment with RootRx as we talked about earlier, um, just RootRx alone with the nitrogen. And uh, as you can see, maybe not quite as much growth as, as the Rutex one, but still a significant amount of growth. Um, very happy with the results on that, um, especially with the reduction uh, in nitrogen. So jumping into another uh, experiment demo that I did. This is a little older block. This is third leaf, what we're looking at right now. Um, so I took pictures and took trunk measurements from spring, from that spring. Uh, all the way to the fall, followed them um, throughout the whole year. I picked these two trees in particular to follow uh, because they were so close in trunk diameter and bigger. Um, but out of the whole orchard, I picked a couple rows on each side uh, and, I, and I followed 20 trees uh, on each side. So 20 redox trees, 20, um, like a, a grower standard uh, tree that you, if you will, <clears throat> and uh, overall, you could see the outcome. So the top would be the redox trial. That was uh, Rutex H85 with uh, triplex zinc. Um, the bottom was a triple eight with miners um, and a zinc EDTA 5%. And I did the same thing as far as a dollar, per, dollar for dollar program uh, on both of them. In the end, the result was about a 30% increase uh, in trunk diameter on the redox side. Um, there was also, you know, some more uniformity, but really both both got some good growth out of it. Um, but we're happy with that success. <clears throat> okay, this is a short video. I'll play for you guys here. Um, before I play it, you could see that it's starting off on some small trees. So these smaller trees right here were planted in spring of 2020. These are almonds. Um, the applications that were made throughout this year was CAN 17, just small shots of CAN 17 throughout the year. These are also on very sandy ground, as you can see. So um, I think that uh, maybe leaching could have been an issue and, and maybe they didn't take up as much as that uh, nutrient as, as they wanted. Um, as the video plays, you're gonna see some bigger trees and those trees were planted in the fall of 2019. I'll just play it and I'll go over the application. The application of the bigger trees was a 10.264 uh, with our triplex microfoliable and uh, Rooter X throughout the year, same thing. They just put up a, uh, a pop-up and slowly pulled from it throughout the year. So those were uh, 2020, these were planted in 2019. Um, I think it was October of 2019. So pretty big difference there. You can see the uniformity color. Um, they also, you know, they had a lot of nutrients there to, to, uh, to help with the take up, not as much leaching. Um, and then back to the just can 17 block. Big difference. I don't know if some of that has to do with maybe planting early on or in the fall um, compared to spring, but uh, it was a good example. Okay, jumping into this next trial. This was a trial that was done in Oregon. This is, uh, this is fairly similar to the one that Jeff was talking about as far as a fumigated situation and non-fumigated situation. Um, there was a couple of areas, I think there were some houses in here as well, where they, they could not fumigate. Um, so they did an experiment with RootRx. The experiment with RootRx was done at a gallon uh, right after planting, uh, another gallon in June, and another gallon in July. So three shots, pretty high rates. Um, did some trunk measurements on, on this planting as well. And as you can see, the results uh, show 
down here at the bottom, you have the fumigated soil on the left, uh, fumigated soil plus root or X, non-fumigated soil would be the blue and non-fumigated soil plus root or X. And basically what the goal here was to uh, drive root growth. So as you can see, you know, the root growth is gonna translate into the trunk diameter, um, into the vigor of the plant. So this is in the first year. These were uh, starting to be, the first uh, uh, measurement was taken directly after planting. The last one was done uh, in the fall. And you can see the percent increases here. So you have fumigated soil, the first one, uh, not fumigated soil with Ruter X, both showed good results. Non-fumigated soil, obviously a little bit lower um, than non-fumigated soil with Ruter X. So that's after year one. And then this next graph is from year one, so 2016 at planting to fall 2018. So that would be three growing seasons. Um, so as you can see, the fumigated soil after three growing seasons is starting to kind of lack and, and the nutrients I think are starting to take off. But the goal there is to really grow roots. Um, and it looks like that has been accomplished. So you have fumigated soil first, uh, fumigated soil with Ruter X, non-fumigated soil in blue, and then non-fumigated with soil with Ruter X. This picture uh, is describing that. So these are both fumigated blocks. The left is uh, fumigated without Ruter X and the right is fumigated with Ruter X. <clears throat> um, so you could see some visual differences as far as uh, uh, tree growth on top as well. Okay, lastly, we have um, a root development trial that we did uh, last year and this year, this is with West SI. West SI is a, a former University of uh, California Farm Advisor, um, and he did young potted non perel almonds on Nemegard rootstock. This was done in uh, northern San Joaquin Valley. And the goal of it was to evaluate the benefits of adding Ruter X uh, to young almond trees and a, and a grower standard. Um, what he did was he measured the uh, root growth dry weight and the trunk caliper. <clears throat> so what you can see as far as the application rates of the grower standard, he did uh, uh, one gallon per tree for the 20, uh, triple 20 uh, application, did one application of that. And then later on in mid season did a second application of the same rate. Uh, the Ruter X, he just added on top of that program. He did a half gallon up front and then uh, a quart uh, later on with that second application. Wes does a, a very thorough job in his trials, did a great job on this. This has some vermiculite, um, some uh, peat moss and some native soil mixed in with these potted plants. So they're all accurate. Um, he also wrapped all the bottoms in, in foil. So that way when the sun's going across, all of the roots are getting the same amount of sunlight. So one side isn't burnt and the other side isn't cold. They're all about the same. Um, you can see all the different trial markings he has in there. Uh, and this is a, a visual of him washing off all those roots, pulling them out, washing them off, getting all that dirt off of them. And then lastly, drying them down and uh, measuring the caliper size. <clears throat> so as a result, the uh, Ruter, Ruter X produced a statistically significant increase in root dry weight. So we have a 26.3% increase on the root dry weight um, with the Ruter X application. So really good result there. Let me go back. And then on the uh, on the caliper size uh, increase, the trunk diameter, there wasn't a necessarily statistical difference, but as far as a numerically uh, greater trunk caliper difference, uh, Ruter X had a 10.8% increase from the grower standard. So overall, we saw a really good increase in growth uh, in root growth and uh, trunk diameter. And that's it for the trials and uh, in-field experiences. Thank you guys for uh, joining. We're gonna do some uh, frequently asked questions. If you guys don't have any questions, if you do, please feel free to go ahead and type those in right now. We can answer those best we can. Um, if not, we have some questions that you know we, we generally hear and, and we can go over those. Maybe those will answer some of uh, the questions that you may have, but don't wanna ask necessarily. Let's see. You have anything on the chat? 
I lost my chat box. I lost it I too. Have a, I, have a question. I have a question for Jeff. This is Jared. Yeah. What, Jeff, you mentioned on some of your, um, you've had some experience using some organic nitrogen sources. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming those are maybe some amino acid or fish emulsion, corn steep, you know, what, what's been, you've seen more and more of those come in the market. What, what has been your experience in, in general um, if, as you've evaluated those in, in like a new orchard planting or in, in almonds say? You know, most of our work, you know, we've, we've done a lot of protein hydrolysate um, type materials. We've done fish, you know, we've, we haven't done a, a ton of corn steep stuff. I know the organic guys really, really, I think are in, more into that, but um you know, I, I, for the most part, I, I don't think it really makes a, a humongous difference what type of one you use. We, I just think it's beneficial to get more carbon in the soil in that root zone. Um, you know, for this particular trial, we, we had both types of, you know, a protein hydrolysate and a, uh, and a fish product, and we both think um, that both did well. Um, so I, I don't think, uh, I don't think I can specifically say one's better than the other. I just think, you know, getting some more carbon um, in the root zone is, is, is the main thing. So you're seeing, I mean, you, you looked at that maybe versus a UN, you know, a 32 or something, and you do see what's, what's been your observations as you compared those two together to a conventional, to a organic. Uh, I, and, and so for this, there, both of these, well, the, this soil one for, in, for specifically is not, is not an organic, uh, situation. I think it's it's not necessarily a, a replacement of your conventional nitrogen source. I just think it's an addition that will help, um, you know, biological activity and, you know, have some plant benefits as well. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I have one for you um, that I've gotten before. I'm sure I know you have. And the question is, um, if my nutrient levels in the soil um, are good and nematode levels of sampling are very low is fumigating necessary um yeah you know i think uh that that depends on a lot of different factors um you know if your nematode levels are low that may mean you don't use a certain type of fumigant but if you're going you know prunus back to prunus you might have some of that um you know, replant disease that we're seeing now in almonds a lot. Uh, almonds following almonds, which they think is a complex of a fungal pathogen um, complex. So I, I think uh, I, I think fumigation isn't necessarily um, needed in, in all situations, but I think in most situations, um, you know, I would definitely consider it. You know, all the trial work that we've done um, suggests that fumigation always out out uh, competes, you know, non-fumigation situations. So um, I, I'm going to keep recommending that, you know, you keep fumigating when possible. And if not, you know, that's why we try, try, uh, have these, have these webinars, have these discussions so we can, yeah. we can have alternatives. So. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, I, we didn't get into this a whole lot, I guess, on, on, on this one, but it, one that comes up a lot when we're talking about kind of early, early establishment and um, I guess, yeah, I guess early establishment is pruning, right? So I think that's kind of comes up a lot, I, I guess. Um, do, do you have any insight on that you'd like to share, kind of what you've seen? So I don't have a, a huge amount of experience in pruning per se, especially new orchards. I just haven't been in the industry long enough to really have a lot of hands on there. Um, but what I do know is I think there's a balance for pruning between, you know, making sure you get adequate growth and you're not cutting off too much wood because that's going to be your, your fruiting wood for the next year. Um, I think there's a balance between that and, you know, shaping your tree, getting a good structure, making sure, you know, you keep your middles open, um, for equipment to pass through and different things like that. I, you know, I don't think it's either you prune or you don't prune. I think there's a balance. Um, in my opinion, somewhere in there where you can, you can build a good structure, but also keep as much wood as possible, um, you know, to, to help with, with fruiting wood next year or for, you know, just that increased carbohydrate load to help the trees push out the following season. So, um, yeah. Yeah. 
So I usually get a question a lot when reviewing kind of early season establishment programs of, um, especially on sandier ground, um, where they're like, okay, I want to do, you know, so many bags of 1152, or, you know, I want to do 10 gallons of 1034 or something like that. Cause I feel like I need my early phosphorus applications. And then I, I come back with, well, you know, we got this Rutex product. It's a 215.2 and um, Rutex flowable. And, you know, we can get away with maybe a couple half gallon shots for maybe a gallon and a half over the first couple months. And, um, or, you know, maybe three gallons over the whole year or something like that. I get a lot of pushback. I guess maybe I don't know if this is a Jeff question or a Nick question. And, um, but uh, where just looking, uh, you know, what, that I, I think we talked about that a little bit with kind of availability of phosphorus products, but Nick, Nick, what's your kind of, what's, what's your, what's your take on that? Uh, you're talking about like, as far as units, you know, yeah, unit supplied, how do, how do I convert like, okay, I want so many units and now you're telling me mm -hmm. that I only need two units. Like, how does that even make sense? Right. Yeah. Well, it is tough to, to wrap your head around it when you're used to doing something a certain way. Um, if you're looking at something like, for example, like 1034.0, you know, you're, you're, you're picking a, a certain amount of units and that that you're going to apply. So say you're going to apply 40 units and that's usually what you're used to, you know, while that 1034.0 is sitting in the tank, it is completely plant available. Um, but when you do send it out, just like you were going over earlier, there's other factors that are going on in the soil where it is going to tie up. So the efficiency of that product is not very high you know I, i've heard anywhere between five to eight percent actually efficiency that you're getting into the plant so when you look at that how many units are actually hitting the tree and so that's where our products come in um, where they are complex with an amino acid and, and they are highly efficient so you can use less in this sense less is more you can use less of that product um, and still get the same efficiency amount so that's kind of where, you know, where we go um, on our products and, and how we compare that to, because that, that is a question I get. Um, you know, I've heard our products are anywhere from 15 to 20 to one when, when you're looking at comparing units versus our products. Yeah. The, uh, the, the challenge, I guess, and, and you brought this up in a couple of your, your field examples was, you know, on sandier ground, Mm -hmm. leaching can be a big concern and i think jeff you, you said that a couple of times as well that they were done sandier sandier spots and things things are moving um how important do you think root interception is for a lot of these you talk a lot about like combining humix with with nutrient products to kind of decrease leaching and and, and, and all the all the stuff we attribute uh to humic acid but i i feel like an important part of that equation is really how many roots are down there, right? So, uh, yeah, what's your opinion on that? Uh, Jeff or Nick, who wants to take it? As far as, um, you know, roots in, in, in importance to um, uptake or just as um, efficiency of, the, of an application? Or? Yeah, efficiency of an application, yeah. especially in a sandy ground. It, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I know yeah. I on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, it's like those four R's that they teach you, you know, right application, right time, um, or a, a right, right product. But I think, um, you know, in, in sandy ground, it, it actually, in my mind, is a long, almost a little easier to um, control where uh, your product's going to go and how, how to, um, I guess, estimate where in the root zone, you know, when you apply that material, where it's going to go. Um, and maybe that's just me because I grew up in that, in the sandy grounds and I, I, I understand kind of how they work and how they, how they function and how they, how they react to a fertilizer application. Um, but it, it, CEC, you know, humix cation exchange capacity is a huge deal in the sand. And if, you know, sometimes we apply all the fertilizers that we can and everything's just set out perfectly and we still don't get the response that we, that we, that we need. And, and um, I think part of that's just because the soil just can't hold the nutrient. And, you know, we've seen SOP, you know, uh, potash, we've seen that thing leach, you know, in one season in the sandy soils, you know, down to, down to two, three feet, you know, from an application. So the stuff moves. Um, it's just, I guess, 
half the battle is knowing your ground, knowing how it's going to react, knowing, you know, where your water is going after a fertilizer application. And, and maybe you target that back end of the fertilizer application just so you don't blow it through the root zone. Um, but, you know, I think with, with irrigation technologies, the way that they are now, it's, it's easier and it's becoming easier and easier to target a certain zone for our fertilizer applications, which is helping a lot because I mean, if you're not getting uh, that, those fertilizers, those nutrients to the root zone of those young trees, um, you, you know, you're not going to get, you're not going to get the response. And that's the hardest part sometimes. All right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I got a Todd comment Gray. here. Go yeah, ahead. Go ahead okay. Todd Gray brought up a good comment and he was talking about uh, timing in our sandier soils is key because we can't necessarily preload the soil bank with certain nutrients because of our leaching problems. Uh, that's a that's a good point. You know, a lot of times you you want to go preload the soil, and and maybe in those situations, you can't. Jeff, you got a lot of experience, you know, with that growing up in in that environment. You know, anything to expand on on that comment? I mean, you kind of covered it. Yeah, but. yeah. You know, that that just goes right with the the comment I made earlier about SOP, where we've seen it move quite dramatically within one season, and it surprised us. Um, and that's that same idea of preloading the soil. You know, that's why some of our, you know, sulfate of potash applications go right before we start, you know, bloom. So we mm -hmm. don't blow it through the, through the root zone during the winter rains. Um, so that's, and that's also why for our trials and all this, all, all this uh, discovering of, you know, or exploratory stuff we've, we've been trying to do has been, you know, more, more frequent applications, lower rates, um, and just trying to spoon feed because if we, if we have two or three big shots of fertilizer, we're just going to blow half of it through the root zone. Um, uh, slow release stuff works too. You know, there's been some studies. I know David Dahl has had some on young almonds as he's done a slow release nitrogen study. Um, I don't know what soils they had there, but that's another avenue you might consider. Um, but even then there's still, there's some, some built-in efficiency factors that you lose too when you have those materials. Um, just sitting on the surface right. for a while. So yeah. that, is, yeah. that is something I was going to dive into a little more too, and I'm piggybacking on that with, you know, some of the guys that and the sandier souls that preload uh, over winter, you know, as far as efficiency and, and some of your trials that you do, I mean, do you see a greater impact by spoon feeding instead of doing a preload? I mean, do you, would you recommend preloading as well or just, maybe saving that budget dollar and, and turn it into, you know, infield during the year, spoon feeding throughout the growing season. I think personally, um, if you, if you need to change parts per million, if you need pounds in the soil, I wouldn't change your amendment um, recommendations, you know, and, and switch solely to a fertigation type um, program. But if I think you're, you're, you're mainly in the ballpark with all of your major cations, um, I think you, you can definitely take the approach of using more efficient fertilizers in season to keep up with tree demand. Um, but from a soil balance and a soil characteristic perspective, um, I still think there's, there's a place, there's a time and place for bulk amendment applications as well. I don't think we should get rid of any of those. Um, I just think for, for in-season demand um, and maybe even demand for, for the following season, um, you know, the tree may take up nutrients that it's not even going to use this year and may bank it in a bud and use it next year. Mm -hmm. I, I think you can, you can get away with some of that with, with a lot of these high efficiency, uh, like redox materials, high efficiency, low use rate uh, products. Mm -hmm. so, um, I wouldn't get rid of, uh, I wouldn't get rid of some of these preloadings, um, especially for potassium, because um, as we all know, the, the, the plants are going to use just as much potassium as they're going to use nitrogen. So, um, we definitely need pounds uh, in some situations there. Yeah. So. Kind of, a yeah, we see a lot. On, oh, go ahead. We see a lot on young, on young orchards. We have a lot of avocados and lemons going in the ground right now, right now on the coast. And one of the biggest issues we see with fertilizing young orchards is either going way too far over and burning roots. Mm -hmm. um, with high concentrations on drippers or the flip side of completely missing the root ball with the application um, and and just losing it through leaching of an area where there just is not roots yet 
So that's something, especially in that first year when you have a really limited root ball where we're just not, avocados have super tender roots. So you need to be very, very careful with applications and that's a big deal. But then the flip side of, okay, we're using a sprinkler and our effective root zone is maybe a one foot wide root zone or maybe three or four feet by the end of the year, but we have a 12 foot throw sprinkler. We're just wasting a lot of product. So just something to keep in mind when looking at fertility applications, I guess, and mm -hmm. where they go, especially on sandy ground. Cause like you said, if mm -hmm. you put it, if you miss the roots, it's gone. It's gone. So it's not, it's not coming back. So, yeah. Um, does anybody else have any questions they wanted to, wanted to throw out here? Um, I appreciate everybody sticking around here. We're a couple minutes after the hour. Nick, did you have anything else? Um, no, I think I, well, I guess one question uh, that I just kind of came up with now was, you know, on established blocks, we really don't bat an eye at doing like a post-harvest application going into fall because you're thinking about, um, you know, the crop that came off that tree and you want to replenish it. What, what are your thoughts, Jeff, on like preloading uh, a young tree, whether it's foliar or, or uh, in the soil, to prepare going through dormancy for next spring, coming out of spring? Is that something, you know, our, our winters, it's inevitable, our winters are changing, you know, so we're not getting as cold as we used to. There's some sunny days. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that as far as preloading, even with irrigation, uh, preloading some nutrients into that tree so that way it can have a, a more... A vigorous pop out of, uh, out of dormancy. Um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously the costs are, are prohibitive, mm -hmm. you know, but I, I think regardless of if you have a mature orchard or a young orchard, if you can do a post-harvest, um, if anything, a post-harvest soil applica uh, application just to help that root zone to, to store more carbohydrates, you know, and then maybe maybe that translates into less bacterial problems next year because now you have more to fend off that pathogen or it increases your, your, uh, the amount of laterals that you break, you know, once you start to leaf out. Um, I, I do think there's a benefit, no doubt, you know, it just depends on if the, if the cost benefit, you know, analysis is there, if it makes sense, um, then, and, and it's easier now when, when we have drip blocks, when right. you establish these orchards where you don't have to have a tractor go through there. Um, so I, I do think regardless of if you have an older orchard or a young orchard, a post-harvest application is, is only going to benefit. I don't, I don't see it uh, not being beneficial um, to helping the tree, you know, come out the following spring. Yeah. So. Oh well, yeah, that's, uh, I agree. That's, that's, uh, that's probably, the last, last question I have there, Danny, I just had that afterthought. And so I wanted to get Jeff's opinion on it, but yeah, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate, appreciate every, put on any more questions. Um, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and giving us all the information that you did. Um, Danny, thank you for all the information that, that you gave us and went over. Um, hope everybody enjoyed it. Oh, Danny, do you want to go over this real quick? Yeah, we're going to, and your follow-up emails, you'll get a, uh, you'll, we're going to attach this uh, little booklet here that is um, uh, our, our permanent crop establishment crop booklet. Um, we will go through a lot of principles we talked about today, product timings, product, product use rates and things like that. So, and then um, we'll also include this one specifically for avocados, but we'll, we'll put one together for most of the guys on here today. We're more on the almond walnut side. So we'll put one together specifically for, um, for almonds, kind of a general tree establishment program from Redox for, for crop specific for maybe the first year or two of almonds. Um, just for your reference, you can kind of see what, what we're thinking with these four products and where they fit in and timings and budgeting and things like that. So you can get a better idea of where it might fit into some of your fertility recommendations. So, yeah. So with that, I mean, thanks. I hope we uh, communicated our passion, excitement in growing crops and, um, yeah, you got our contact info. So if you have any more questions, don't hesitate to reach out. So yep. thank you. All righty. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Nope. Thank you, guys.